The peace of Christ be with you. And welcome to worship this morning. In our service, we also welcome our NUMA choir. And this is the final time they'll be singing for this term and starting up in September again at those Wednesday services. But uh, I am so grateful that they are here today and grateful for all the ways their leaders, um, Deidre, Christina, Bryn, a couple of other coaches have carried on, not just in recent days, but over the last two years. And so grateful the way a number of the singers meeting on Zoom and everything, and here they are to sing for us today. Next Sunday, a number of special things. It is one of the special high holy days in the church calendar, Pentecost, when we celebrate the coming of the Spirit and wind and fire. Uh, so be prepared to come, ready to sing with all your heart and body and move and celebrate. Uh, we invite you, if you feel so moved, to wear red, yellow, orange, some kind of fiery celebratory color symbolizing the tongues of fire that came at Pentecost. It is also, and you can be excited about this part too, the annual congregational meeting. <laughs> <laughs> And that will be on Zoom at 1 p.m. So if the weather cooperates, we might have some refreshments across the way after church to celebrate also. But hopefully that will still give you a window of hour, hour and a half to get home for the congregational meeting at 1. And we're going to start the congregational meeting with the sacrament of Holy Communion. So uh, we invite you to join for that as well. And that will be on Zoom. I know that Patricia Alexis would like to make an announcement, so I invite her to come forward. I feel so short all of a sudden. Um, good morning, everyone. I have spent a lot of time thinking about what I'm going to say this morning. I'm talk talking about focus on first. And I thought maybe I would mention the very long history of Dunbar, of Ryerson, and of Pacific Spirit United Church who have supported uh, focus on first for many, many years. And then I thought, no, you know, I thought I'd check out some history and do all kinds of things. No, won't do that. The next thing I thought I'd talk about was um, donor fatigue. I mean, every day I get things in my email, in the mail, uh, you see things on TV, and, and every, there's so many wonderful things out there for us to contribute our, our hard-earned dollars on. But I thought, nope, that's not what I'm going to talk about. Then I, th I was going to bring the bear, which I have named Frederick, or Freddy for first, and then I thought, no, nah, don't do that, Patricia. Then I thought, well, you know, I'll look in the Bible to find some, something to help me, some quotes or something to help me um, figure out what to say. And I thought, no. Nope. So what I thought I would tell you is the plain hard truth. In our last campaign, we received, and I, I don't even know if this is appropriate to say this, but I'm saying it anyways. We received under $100 in donations for FIRST, and um, there's really not, you know, that's just what, it, what happened, and that's the way it is. So I'm here this morning to say, I don't want to get, make people feel guilty. Um, I want, if you possibly can, it would be wonderful if you could make a do donation, however small, to uh, focus on FIRST. It's the last week of our campaign, and it would really help. So thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia. And I believe the focus this time is on track pants and ponchos, two items that are really useful for people living in the downtown east side. Let us now breathe in the beauty of this day. 
the beauty of one another's company. And remember that no matter how dark, how hard things are in our world, always and ever, in our midst is the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join responsively in our call to worship. God's invitation is to freedom and justice. When we imprison ourselves with past hurts or grudges, When we are bound by narrow limits of what it means to be good neighbors. When we are trapped by obligations and burdened schedules. Let us pray. 
God of freedom, God of liberating love, thank you for the freedom we enjoy to gather here to praise you. In this time of worship, may we be enabled to loosen our grip on our fears and fretfulness, then letting go into the depths of silence, may we find ourselves held by you and linked anew to all life in this wild and wondrous world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And our opening hymn, Come and Find the Quiet Center. I invite forward any young folks, any young at heart, any teenagers brave enough to sit up here with me. Uh, please come forward and let's have a conversation about our scripture story today. Hello, Selby. Come, come join me. Donovan, Joanne, Aaliyah. Oh, look at them all. <laughs> now there's more than one reason I'm glad Numa's here today. <laughs> Hello, Sebby. So I have brought something. Hello, Jerome. I brought something interesting for us to talk about today. Everybody know what this is? Joanne? Chain. Chain and it's really heavy. Anybody want to try and feel it? It's really heavy. Yeah. So what do you do with a big heavy chain? What's a big heavy chain for? Joanne? Okay. We might talk about whether that's a good or bad thing to do. If you had an animal that you didn't want to escape, you might chain it. Yeah. Donovan? That's right, Sebby. Well, Donovan, what were you going to say? Like that picture. If people go to jail. Now, I looked... Uh, whether people still use chains. Apparently, 
The time that chains are used for people going to jail is when they're being transported from one place to another. There's not many jails in Canada anyways where they actually chain someone up when they're in jail. But I think there are still places in the world, and there were certainly times in history, when people were chained up. What do you think that would feel like, to be chained up? What would be hard about that? What would be hard about being chained up? To like walk, to like move to have any freedom. So let me ask you, are all of you free? Yeah? What are you free to do? This is a dangerous question, isn't it? <laughs> what are you free to do? Joanne? You're free to read your books, and you're supposed to read your books, yeah. And you're free to, to choose between a number of different books, which some people at some points in history, and some people still today, aren't free to read whatever they want. Donovan? Like playing. You can go out and you can play. You can freely come and go to a lot of different places. Well, not everyone in the world gets that freedom. Some people, it's like, even if they don't actually have chains around them, it's like they're, they're chained by the rules they have to live under. Aaliyah, what were you going to say? Going to school, you have the freedom to go to school. Do you have the freedom not to go to school? <laughs> There's a question, eh? Sometimes there are limits on our freedom, and maybe that's a good thing. Hannah, what were you going to say? Free to love. Free to love, yeah. And in this church, we like to say, you're free to choose who you love. Joanne? Free to run around. We are so lucky here, aren't we? So blessed, all the freedoms we have. Well, today in church, I don't think it's the same story you're going to hear in Godly Play, but today in church, we're going to hear a story about Paul and Silas who were not free. They were put in jail, and they, they were put in jail wrongly. They just tried to heal somebody, but the people didn't like that, and so they put them in jail, and they weren't free. But a big earthquake happened, and their chains were loosened, and they could have walked away. They could have been physically free, but they didn't leave because... They knew the jailer was going to get in trouble, and they were worried about him. So their hearts said, we're not free to just walk away. So sometimes there's freedoms that are good, 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 and sometimes we're bound. There are rules or limits that are good also if they involve caring for other people. Like there's some interesting old hymns that even say, we're chained to God. And we say we're chained by grace, but that grace, like a chain, can hold us to God and hold us to other people to make good decisions that are good for everybody, not just for ourselves. It's an interesting thought. Whether chains and rules are a good thing, whether freedom is always a good thing. One more thing I want to tell you, because it's important because you're a wonderful bunch of singers. Do you know what Paul and Silas were do doing when they were in jail, all chained up? Donovan? They were singing. They were singing praises to God. Even in that hard, hard circumstance where they didn't feel free, they were all chained up, they were still singing praises to God. So I hope if you're ever feeling chained up or unhappy or any of those hard things, you can still sing praises to God. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you for coming forward. And I invite anyone who would like to go out to godly play with Emma and Irene to do so.
The scripture reading today comes from Act 16, verses 16 to 34, from the message, and tells the story of Paul and Silas in and out of prison. One day, on our way to the place of prayer, a slave girl ran into us. She was a psychic, and with her fortune-telling, made a lot of money for the people who owned her. She started following Paul around, calling everyone's attention to us by yelling out, these men are working for the Most High God. They're laying out the road of salvation for you. She did this for a number of days until Paul, finally fed up with her, turned and commanded the spirit that possessed her, out, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. And it was gone, just like that. When her owners saw that their lucrative little business was suddenly bankrupt, they went after Paul and Silas, roughed them up and dragged them into the market square. Then the police arrested them, pulled them into court with the accusation, these men are disturbing the peace. Dangerous Jewish agitators subverting our Roman law and order. By this time, the crowd had turned into a restless mob out for blood. The judges went along with the mob, had Paul and Silas's clothes ripped off and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open. All the prisoners were loose. Startled from sleep, the jailer saw all the doors swinging loose on their hinges. Assuming that the prisoners had escaped, he pulled out his sword and was about to do himself in, figuring he was as good as dead anyway. When Paul stopped him, don't do that. We're all still here. Nobody's run away. The jailer got a torch and ran inside. Badly shaken, he collapsed in front of Paul and Silas. He led them out of the jail and asked, Sirs, what do I have to do to be saved, to really live? They said, Put your entire trust in the Master Jesus. Then you'll live as you were meant to live, and everyone in your house included. They went on to spell out in detail the story of the master. The entire family got in on this part. They never did get to bed that night. The jailer made them feel at home, dressed their wounds, and then he couldn't wait till morning was baptized. He and everyone in his family. There in his home, he had food set out for a festive meal. It was a night to remember. He and his entire family had put their trust in God, and everyone in the house was in on the celebration. This is a story of our faith. Amen. Thanks be to God.
of captivity is not a world I know much about. And I'm trusting most of you don't either. During my short stint in the legal profession, when I did family and criminal law, I visited a couple of jails. And while it was intimidating to walk through the guarded entrances and among the prisoners, I always, always had the freedom to leave. And probably the closest I have ever come to knowing actual physical confinement was being trapped in an elevator once for 20 minutes or so, which of course seemed like an eternity, but was, in the scheme of things, pretty darn minimal. Being born into an era of women's liberation and permissive parenting, and being born in a country like Canada and a denomination like the United Church, there have been very few situations that have made me feel subjugated, restrained, imprisoned, chained down, or anything like enslaved. Occasionally, I have felt in the grips of addiction, like overeating, binge TV watching. But honestly, I do not know much about what it is like to have your freedom of movement, speech, thought, or activities restricted in any seriously limiting fashion, from without or from within. Perhaps all of us can relate to restrictions on freedoms a little more than we could two and a half years ago. But interesting, I tried to Google skirt search for a joke about being jailed during pandemic lockdowns. And what I found instead was a whole lot of internet anger about relatively privileged folks like myself comparing their experience to true incarceration. In today's story from the Book of Acts, there are many characters that are in real need of some kind of liberation and freedom, and in need of release from all the harmful ties that bind, literally and metaphorically. There's the imprisoned Paul and Silas, of course, but there's also the slave girl and her owners, the jailers, perhaps even the ones in the story who accuse and imprison others could be said to be trapped in a system of oppression and injustice. The action of our Bible story begins with the healing of the slave girl. She was doubly bound enslaved to her owners, but also subject to this mysterious power that controlled her. She is healed. She is set free. I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. That's what Paul said to the spirit that had gripped her. Whatever was controlling that young woman, any malevolent spirit, compulsion, addiction, fear, anxiety, illness, it was overcome. And the young woman discovered a new freedom, a wholeness of being. The actual Greek used is fascinating. Pneuma pathona. A python spirit is literally what the Greek text says. A reference apparently to the Greek god Apollo and the Delphic oracles and the serpent that guarded them which probably only Bible nerds like me would be interested in. But ponder the phrase for a woman, a moment. Python spirit. And see if your imagination, a la Harry Potter perhaps, begins to picture whatever it is that binds any of us as a long, slithering serpent that wraps itself around you 
around that long ago servant girl, holding tight, confined, constricted, unable to breathe, slowly being crushed. And if there is something or someone doing that in your life, hear this word of healing in the name of Jesus Christ, come out. And church, hear what the Spirit is saying to you. You are called to the task of healing, of working towards liberation, of discovering through the love of God a new wholeness for yourself and for others. But what might be good news to one person isn't always good news for another. When the slave girl is healed, she can no longer tell fortunes, which means that she can no longer make a lot of money for her owners. And they didn't like it. It's bad for business, the bottom line, the profit margin, the status quo. And so they whip up the crowd against Paul and Silas, the ones who had done the healing. For Paul and Silas, the end result was predictable. They were arrested, tried in a kangaroo court, convicted on trumped-up evidence that included a lot of name-calling and a good dose of anti-Semitism. Paul and Silas were stripped, beaten, flogged, then led away. Not to crucifixion, mind you, but to prison. Though not just any old cell, but the innermost one, with no windows, no light, a place of darkness. And they had their feet clamped, held tight by chains or stalks. So it was a place of no movement, no freedom. Then the writer takes us again to a moment of healing and release, a resurrection moment, if you will. As Paul and Silas were singing praises to God at the midnight hour in that in-between time, moving from one day to the next. Just then, there's an earthquake, a shattering, shaking event. And I'd invite you not to get caught up in any literal wondering about how an earthquake could be focused and strong enough to open the prison doors and unsnap the chains while basically leaving everything else intact. For this is miracle. This is metaphor. What we are seeing here is the opening of the tomb. It is God's power of light, life, and love, breaking through every tomb, prison, darkness, sin, every python-squeezing demon, dark spirit possession. This is the good news moment. The church is about resurrection, believing and experiencing freedom and new life, and then sharing the gift with others. Unfortunately, the word freedom has taken on some ugly connotations in recent times. The Freedom Convoy usurped the word to such an extent that as well as conjuring up images of liberation and release, freedom now conjures up images of lawlessness and disregard for the rights and even safety of others. This week, with the news from Uvalde, Texas, of yet another horrific, heart-wrenching school shooting, we wonder again about freedom. And more specifically, that controversial freedom to bear arms. I think many of us would echo President Biden's question. When in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? If we are to avoid or even lessen the frequency of such tragedies, there must be limits to freedom. In times when the health and well-being of all trumps the right to individual freedoms. In Bible study this week, we 
It's a wonderfully astute and curious and creative bunch of people. We spent much time exploring the meaning of freedom and its possible opposites, some of which were lack of choice, fear, and even at some level, responsibility. And I learned a wonderful and helpful phrase. Just shows, even when you get to my age, you can learn new things. Liberty, but not license. I'd never come upon this phrase before, and one might think my liberal arts education had been sorely lacking. For the phrase is several centuries old, apparently, used extensively by the likes of John Locke, John Stuart Mills, John Milton, and Oliver Wendell Holmes. Irish-born British parliamentarian Edmund Burke captured the push and pull nature of freedom when he wrote, men are qualified for civil liberty in exact proportion to their disposition to put moral chains upon their own appetite. It is ordained, wrote Edmund Burke, ordained in the eternal constitution of things that men of intemperate minds cannot be free. Their passions forge their fetters. And for Milton, the distinction between liberty and license is first and foremost a theological matter. Milton's understanding of Christian liberty emphasizes the individual Christian's ability to self-govern by exercising liberty of conscience according to the Spirit's guidance within the context of obedience to the Word of God. In our scripture story, Paul and Silas demonstrated such obedience. They could have run away. They could have gone hog wild with their miraculous newfound freedom. But even though the walls and chains no longer bound them, they were bound to follow in God's ways of love. And that meant concern for the other, concern for their jailer, the very one who had imprisoned them. One of the stories that most influenced my Christian walk was the story of a Canadian woman named Karen Ridd and her imprisonment in a jail in El Salvador way back now in 1989. Karen was there as a member of the Peace Brigades. She was trying to help the poor and the oppressed. She was trying to stop the torture. It was a very serious and sometimes dangerous business she was engaged in, but she went about it all with a certain lightness of heart that she says stemmed from her faith. She tells an amusing story of being interrogated by the immigration authorities concerning her involvement with human rights and telling them that she was, in fact, by trade, a clown. And to demonstrate this there in the immigration office, she started blowing up those thin, stretchy balloons and twisting them into animal shapes. By the time her interrogators and all the other staff in the immigration building Many of them, big, burly, tough-looking men, were marveling over their little balloon wiener dogs and saying, make me another one, and I want a pink one. They were stamping her passport and sending her on her way. But for me, the most important story she tells is about the time she and her Colombian friend were taken from the Baptist Mission Church where they worked to a jail in the dark of night. It was a barren and ominous place with many armed guards, and she and her friend were quickly separated and the interrogation began. What was she doing there? Who was she working for? Had she been participating in subversive activities? After several hours of alternating periods of questioning and being left alone with only the anguished cries from elsewhere in the prison to keep her company, Karen was released. After all, she carried a Canadian passport. As the prison guard was escorting Karen to the exit, she glimpsed her friend from Colombia still being held captive in another room. When they got outside, 
And close to that place of blessed freedom, Karen asked her captor to be returned to the jail. She flatly refused to leave without her friend. The astonished guard tried to bully and cajole her into leaving, but she would not. When he told her how foolish she was being, she countered with a question. Would you leave your fellow guards? Would you leave your friend? Karen was returned to herself, and sometime later, both she and her friend were released, relatively unharmed. But in that moment, Karen chose loyalty over liberty, which somehow miraculously resulted in greater freedom. It is a curious kind of freedom that Christ calls us. It's certainly not a willy-nilly, anything-goes kind of freedom. In fact, if Paul and Silas and Karen Ridd are examples, it means sometimes sacrificing our own physical freedom. And maybe we don't live in an oppressive Roman regime or even the more subtle, tyr tyrannical re regimes of some countries today. But we do live in a world where the tyranny of ever greater industry, development, and consumption kills more of our glorious and beautiful forms of life. And we can find the courage. We can take the time and trouble to resist government policies which allow such destruction to continue and policies which perpetuate a world of rich and poor. We can find the courage to relinquish some of our so-called freedoms of luxurious lifestyles for the sake of others and the sake of the planet. And usually what keeps us from such actions is our propensity for security seeking, which can be a prison all its own. With freedom and fright, Christ, we can be free of clinging to a life which sometimes is no life at all. We can instead trust in God and face the risk of resistance, which might even include turning back to the jail sometimes. It probably also includes thinking about those around us who are in prison. And without a shadow of a doubt, it means singing hymns to God even in the darkest hour and the darkest places. May God grant us the courage to do so. Amen.
Please join me in bringing to God our prayers for the week. Loving and gracious God, recently our daily lives have been filled with so many reports of hatred, violence, sickness, and despair that some wonder where you are in all of the evil and chaos which surrounds us. We seem unable or unwilling to stop our pollution or depletion of crucial national resources, despite the warnings and pleadings of knowledgeable environmentalists. India has recorded, has experienced record heat, while floods, windstorms, tornadoes and wildfires have decimated regions throughout the world. Mass shootings are killing innocent people, including young children. Gang wars are escalating in ordinary neighborhoods. Racist attacks are becoming common occurrences. Deaths from dangerous drug consumption are increasing. Patients are di diagnosed with illnesses that require astronomical payments for life-saving drugs. Ordinary citizens are so devoid of hope that they have become incapable of functioning normally. On this today, the day of recognition of UN peacekeepers, the, uh, Russia continues to destroy Ukraine. Yet Lord, even as we lament our failures and fears, we have also witnessed numerous signs of your love and concern for each one of us. Most of us enjoy blessings which some even take for granted. Secure, comfortable homes, loving families, caring friends, peaceful neighborhoods, social agencies and community support services for every age, freedom to democratically elect government representatives, and to travel with relatively few restrictions. We thank you for scientists, medical personnel, and researchers whose constant caring cooperation results in vital new knowledge and ingenious inventions that have transformed the life of many disabled people. We remember especially Rick Hansen, whose collaborative efforts over the past 35 years have brought freeing mobility to those with spinal cord injuries. In Chinatown, we rejoiced when ordinary citizens showed up to clean the graffiti and destruction in that area. We witnessed the ceremony in Kamloops marking the year of grieving by our Indigenous brothers and sisters for unmarked graves of their children who never returned home from residential school because of our ancestors' hurtful policies. Later that week, we experienced a glimmer of progress towards truth and reconciliation when our city council signed partnership agreements for two housing projects proposed by the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations that will contribute much, will contribute, will contribute more much needed and reasonable housing in the city. We are grateful as a congregation to be able to participate with First United, our mission church in the downtown, side, downtown east side, in providing new accommodations for its work among the indigenous folk who constitute the majority of residents there. How encouraging it is also to learn how teachers in our education system are developing programs that enable their students to create their own projects for building better relationships with their indigenous and racial classmates, as well as with the environment we all need to respect. Lord, we give special thanks for our own congregation here at Pacific Spirit, for the participation of the new choir this morning under the skillful leadership of Christina, Deirdre, Deb, and Bryn for the dedication of Reverend Deborah and Reverend Maggie in their ministry with us, and for the genuine care and concern shown by many members and adherents. 
At this time, we pray for all who are ill, especially for Allison, that she might have good days and that she and her whole family will feel supported and surrounded by our love and, love and prayers after this week's hard news. God, hear our prayers, including those we offer in our hearts, while we all join in the New Zealand paraphrase of the prayer Jesus taught us as we say together, Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, Loving God in whom is heaven, the hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen.
May you be free to go out into the world with a daring and a tender love and with arms open wide to offer freedom and healing to others. And as we go, may the grace of Christ attend us, the love of God surround us, and the Holy Spirit set us free for love this day, this coming week, and always. Amen.